so I have to apologize in advance. Um, when I agreed to do this talk, I didn't anticipate getting laryngitis and sounding like Barry White. So <clears throat> I'm trying to nurse the tea, but it may get a little squeaky and deep throughout, so I apologize if it's hard to listen to. Um, so this is a topic that's fairly near and dear to my heart, our comorbidities of atopic dermatitis. And you hear this term thrown around a lot, and I'll try to explain what this means. These are my disclosures, nothing relevant to, uh, to the talk today. <clears throat> so for the outline, we'll break it up into sort of the classic atopic comorbidities that we know about, but maybe discuss some clinically relevant pearls, issues related to sleep, mental health, cardiovascular disease, and then some interesting miscellaneous stuff which comes up um, not infrequently in clinical practice. So these are just some population-based data from some studies we've published um, on the... Uh, <clears throat> on this panel over here, this is looking at children, and this one is looking at adults uh, throughout the, uh, the United States. But you actually see remarkably consistent numbers across the studies. About one quarter reporting a lifetime history of asthma, about 20% reporting current or pa uh, um, history of asthma or asthma in the past year, and then about a third or so reporting history of hay fever, respiratory allergies, higher rates also of food allergies, and they have to take that with a grain of salt because, as you know, many of our patients tell us that they have food allergies, and then it turns out that, you know, it, it's nothing. Um, but what's fascinating is this is throughout the entire U.S. population, including your, you know, your spectrum where the majority are going to be fairly mild. So we really, this is a common problem even in our mild patients and ones that really um, should be addressed in clinical practice. So let's talk about specifically some of these atopic diseases, not just sort of the esoteric that they're there, um, and knowing that you should perhaps refer to an allergist or to other specialists, but really thinking about how it may impact the atopic dermatitis itself. So when we think about hay fever or allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, um, we know that this is a different mechanism now for atopic dermatitis. It's an IgE or immunoglobulin E mediated mechanism. We've learned over time, still controversial, but seeming more and more likely that IgE is not the major player in the atopic dermatitis per se. But what's fascinating, I see this a lot, for many of my patients with milder atopic dermatitis overall, you know, pretty minimal mild lesions in the antecubital popliteal fossae, when they have their seasonal flare-ups of allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, that will set off a really wicked eyelid dermatitis or periorbital dermatitis because once that itch scratch cycle begins, they start rubbing it like hennifies and then the process just gets worse. And so the classic sign we see for respiratory atopy is the Denny Morgan fold, but you can also see profound swelling around the eyelids. So, you know, this is an area um, that may benefit from specific treatment targets. And another issue that comes up very similarly are those patients who have comorbid urticaria or dermatographism, because we know that that's also an IgE-mediated mechanism and technically different from the atopic dermatitis but often overlaps a lot and can set off that itch scratch cycle. So this is one where antihistamines may actually be useful. You know, we all un unfortunately use antihistamines way too much, um, really for their sedating properties, but all the literature has shown they don't do a darn thing for eczema, for the itch at least, in eczema. They help the patients to fall asleep. Clinically though, this is a subset of patients where I actually do see some benefit, but not because it's treating the atopic dermatitis, it's just treating one of the triggers of the atopic dermatitis and thereby prevents it. So this is something where that combination therapy certainly can be useful. Another issue that comes up a lot, which is clinically relevant, is that overlap of atopic dermatitis and allergic con um, contact dermatitis. So, you know, we, we always have these challenges that come up diagnostically where we're not sure, is it contact derm, is it atopic derm? But let's put that aside for a second, and let's talk about those patients where we have a long-standing history of atopic dermatitis, no ambiguity there. Still, there's this issue that comes up where these patients may be at higher risk for allergic con uh, contact dermatitis as well. So these are, there's many studies now that have looked at this and have shown significant results, but I just want to show one of them. It was published in the JAD a little while back. This is a retrospective study, a patch testing study, looking at Don Belsito's data from when he was both in Kansas City and in New York. And what he found was that patients with atopic dermatitis had significantly higher rates of positive patch testing um, than those with non-atopic dermatitis. And intriguingly, the allergens they were reacting to were things in their personal care products. So the formaldehyde releasers were the most common preservatives. Coca imidopropyl betaine was the most common surfactant to be found. So these are things that are classically found in patients' personal care products. And when they're putting on all this junk on their skin, 
oftentimes to soothe their atopic skin, that impaired skin barrier may predispose them to getting that contact dermatitis. So what other allergens might you be concerned about? So this is a, a, a sh smaller study, but it patch testing in children with atopic dermatitis and found that about one quarter had at least one positive patch test with much higher rates of, of uh, relevance and positivity in those who had either hand or foot dermatitis. So this is a particularly high yield group for patch testing. What were the allergens? So Amercol, the other name for Amercol is lanolin. Lanolin is in so many different emollients out there, including aquaphor and a ton of different things that we classically recommend to our patients. Uh, potassium dichromate comes up a lot. Big challenge, though, is we don't really know what its relevance is um, in many scenarios. Uh, nickel is that most common one that comes up in all patch testing, uh, really nationwide and uh, globally. Um, and one that can be relevant, or at least partial relevance to the scenario. But then fragrance mix, like an acid mix, these are, you know, things that are going to be found in a lot of the natural botanical products and personal care products. Methyl chloroisothiazolone, methyl isothiazolone. This we call the epidemic in contact dermatitis now because there's such common um, causes of contact dermatitis. So <clears throat> what do you do about this? Well, the question is, when do you patch test these patients? And unfortunately, we don't have great you know, evidence-based recommendations right now, but there was a recent consensus paper that at least tried to put together the expert opinion from some KOLs really across the spectrum of atopic dermatitis and contact dermatitis. And there were certain groups that were deemed really important subsets to be thinking about. So one, as I mentioned in that study earlier, hand or foot lesions when there's a really a strong predominance or a refractoriness of lesions on the hands and feet, it's one that you want to be thinking about. Um, worsens with topical prescriptions or medicaments. Now, this is not always allergic contact dermatitis. This can be irritancy also from topicals, but it's one that if the patient keeps telling you every time they put on, I don't know, cream, they get a reaction, you need to think about could they be allergic, one, to a you know, class B or D topical steroid or the propylene glycol you know, in there. Um, refractory cases, so ones where it just doesn't behave the way you would anticipate it would with standard topical therapy. And then whenever considering systemic agents, and if you're about to put them on a systemic immunosuppressant, probably a good idea to give them you know, one last ditch effort at some conservative approaches that won't require lifelong or really long-term systemic therapies. Let's move on to uh, sleep disturbances. And this is one that you know, we know about, um, but I think we don't always think about enough. Um, so these are some data from uh, children, from the National Survey of Children's Health, looking throughout the entire population in the United States of children um, with those that had you know, caregiver-reported atopic dermatitis. And what was found was that there were significantly higher rates of sleep disturbances. So um, much higher rates of uh, children reportedly having uh, you know, either one to three nights of increased sleep, but really uh, or four plus nights of disturbed sleep. Now, where did you see it? In particular here, you saw it in that severe subset of patients. Not surprising. Now, what's interesting is, in you look at the, the self-report, you don't necessarily see a signal for the mild to moderate, or at least the caregiver reported mild to moderate. And this is a fascinating issue that comes up in my clinical practice a lot, where I will ask the children, you know, or the, you know, how, how is your sleep doing? I get, oh, fine, you know, especially with the adolescents. One word answer, fine. Um, and then you get from the parents, no, he's not. I, I haven't slept in 16 years, right? <laughs> so it's a totally different, it's a disconnect. And so sometimes there's a reporting bias here. But certainly amongst those severe patients, they're very cognizant of these problems, and it's a major, major issue for them. Um, when it comes to, um, you know, adults, um, similar patterns. And again, you know, now, so this is an area I've done trying to do a lot more research on in adult atopic dermatitis because so much of the literature has been driven by arguably very good research in pediatric populations, but we've had so little research in adults to understand that part of the disease. So these are some data from the 2012 National Health Interview Survey and looked at some basic symptoms of sleep disturbance. So about one third reporting fatigue and insomnia and about a quarter reporting daytime sleepiness. Now keep in mind, Think about all of the, the patients out there who have the mildest disease, who don't even get in to see a dermatologist. These are the mild, mo, driven mostly by the mild ones, and still these kinds of uh, symptoms in adulthood are very, very common. Um, <clears throat> certainly in our patient populations, it's going to be more of a problem. So why should we care? So we looked at this study, and we looked at you know, quality of life disturbances related to fatigue and sleep disturbances. And what we found were that the adults with atopic dermatitis, these are some data from a different study from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES, found that patients with, adult patients with atopic dermatitis had higher rates of 
um, trouble falling asleep, early morning awakenings, feeling unrested, overly sleepy, not getting enough sleep, and then some interesting symptoms suggestive possibly even of like restless leg syndrome and other sleep comorbidities. But what's fascinating is this takes a major toll, and I would argue, and we have more data now in, in submission to show this, probably the number one driver of major quality of life disturbance in patients with atopic dermatitis is the sleep. So, of course, that's driven by the itch, but it's really when they have that sleep signal, boy, oh boy, do you start to see those quality of life issues and chronic disease problems come up. So they, the sleep, the fatigue issues will cause difficulty concentrating when tired, difficulty in terms of memory, activities of daily living, living eating, hobbies, work, finances. So these are you know, really, really impacting our patients. Um, let's talk about mental health symptoms, and this is one that, that's an important one. We've seen studies going back decades now <clears throat> of associations between atopic dermatitis and depression anxiety, different uh, disorders. And this is a, a really a very well done study that was run by Eric Simpson's group um, looking at National Survey of Children's Health and found significantly higher odds of caregiver reported depression, anxiety, ADD, ADHD, conduct disorder, and autism. I mean, these are ones that I think are pro very provocative and get you thinking. Um, but a dose response effect and really suggested that there's, there's a correlation with disease severity. So those who had severe disease had even higher rates of these disorders than those mild to moderate. And you're talking about for ADD, ADHD, one in four children with severe disease have been diagnosed with ADD, ADHD. That means that we're seeing this. These patients are coming to us and whether we're addressing it or not, these are major problems. Similar patterns in adults um, where we don't have quite as much data in the spectrum, but uh, multiple studies now have shown that perhaps one in five adults with atopic dermatitis in the U.S. population based on two different studies meet full clinical criteria for major depressive disorder or were diagnosed and man being managed with dep for depression. And ADD, ADHD also a signal even in adults. So this is not just a problem in our kids, but concentration and attentiveness. These are problems in our adults. So, there's really two things I want you to think about with this. One is, if you have a patient that really has you know, mental health disturbances and is having challenges dealing with life, refer to a mental health specialist, okay? But the other aspect of this is, these are not just you know, independent disorders that happen to be loosely correlated. I would argue that mental health and emotional health is a direct symptom of atopic dermatitis. So you could think of itch as one symptom, sleep as another symptom, and, and mental health as a third system, uh, or symptom, I should say. So what do we do about this? Well, at the very least, we should try to improve the sleep and mental health of patients to improve quality of life. And as I mentioned earlier, these are some of the major drivers of quality of life issues in our patients. If you don't ask, you're not gonna know about it. And I know it's difficult in a busy practice setting and sometimes we're reluctant to ask because we feel like we're gonna open up that Pandora's box and have to bring out that box of tissues. But for those really severe patients, boy, you can change their life when you address these issues well. Um, you know, and patients with atopic dermatitis who have that major component of sleep or mental health disturbances, we're seeing more and more now that if you're aggressive and you improve the disease control, these symptoms go away. It's not just like permanent depression. You can actually improve this and they get better and it's, it's life altering for these patients. So consider a systemic agent. Consider adjunctive treatments to improve sleep uh, or the mental health. Uh, I'm not a fan of the antihistamines because they don't give really any benefit for itch at all, but I try using gabapentin, mirtazapine, SSRIs, which at least will have some adjunctive benefits, minimal, but some adjunctive benefits for the itch. So you can get really a two for one there where you might help the itch, but as well using the sedative hypnotic properties. Um, improving sleep hygiene is a very important one for our patients who haven't slept for a decade or more. They've forgotten what it means to sleep and you have to sort of retrain them. Uh, there's things like relaxation therapy, cognitive behavioral therapies. There's even free apps on the iPhone that patients can use which work quite well. And then, um, you know, sedative medications to help them fall asleep a little bit better are gonna be important. Um, but, you know, just keep in mind they have their own side effects and when patients start using them during the day, they can really get into trouble. So in the last minute, I want to just talk about some emerging comorbidities. And it's not, we could spend two hours talking about all the data of this and the controversy of this, but I just want to point out some, some really exciting potential signals here that may change the way we think about atopic dermatitis and start making us think of it as really a broader chronic disease or a systemic disease the way we approach psoriasis. So cardiovascular comorbidities, you've heard a lot of this 
going, you know, for psoriasis. Question is, is it true also for atopic dermatitis? And in fact, there are now multiple studies um, that have shown higher rates of obesity in both children and adults in atopic dermatitis. And this now, there's a meta-analysis that looked across almost 30 studies that found uh, uh, not a massive effect size, but a you know, highly significant effect uh, in terms of that association. <coughs> Poor behavioral risk factors, so higher rates of smoking, alcohol, things that we're, we expect to see with really bad chronic dis disorders, like patients who are transplant patients or liver failure patients, but we don't expect a for atopic dermatitis, yet we see this. We see the psychosocial effects of this disease. Cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, prediabetes, and even higher rates of cardiovascular events in a number of studies. Now, this is a little controversial, and I can't tell you that we've sorted out at all um, which subset of patients really at higher risk, but this is something that I do see as being clinically relevant in a subset of patients, and I, we address this, and it's something that um, you really need to think about going forward with our patients and certainly as potential outcomes in trials. Some other ones that are going to be clinically relevant, we just don't ask about it. Um, osteoporosis, fractures, and injuries, and I think this is probably related to multiple things. It's multifactorial. One, the unfortunate use that we, you know, have of systemic steroids in this disease, um, which is going to a known trigger for osteoporosis, particularly when they're used in multiple rounds or long courses. Fractures and injuries, which are um, because patients are sedated, they're, you know, they're loopy because of it. They're on sedating medications. They're distracted from their itch. So I've had, uh, you know, one case in clinic, or one day in clinic, where I have three patients who are involved with car accidents or falls in one day, and it's just not a coincidence. Um, child development and infection are the last two ones I want to talk about. So this is an interesting one we need a lot more data for. But when we start thinking about this disease in childhood and how it persists into adulthood and really can change the trajectory of their life, the idea that perhaps if we had better ways of getting long-term control in that earlier stage of the disease, could you get them more productive? Could you get them working? Could you get, you know, this is a major issue um, for, for long-term development. And last is infection. And this is one that we're going to start to see more and more data for. Because we always think about, you know, warts possibly or cutaneous and staph infections and stuff like that. But there's now multiple studies that have suggested it's not just skin infections. And it's probably not just barrier, but it's more about those systemic immune abnormalities or immune dysregulation that Emma was discussing. And really higher rates of strep throat, recurrent ear infections, chicken pox, urinary tract infections. I have a very hard time blaming UTIs on barrier dysfunction with filaggrin mutations. So we don't know if this is related to systemic medication use or if it's just that immune dysregulation, but we're gonna see a lot more coming on that. So the last take home point really is, what do you do here? Well, try to get better disease control and improve the control of itch. Consider systemic agents a little more frequently because they're unfortunately not used nearly enough in the moderate to severe population in the US. Lifestyle modification, we may not be the best people to do that and feel like the primary care doc should be encouraging more you know, uh, sleep hygiene or weight-bearing physical activity, but at the same time, the studies have shown that even a 30-second intervention by a physician on a repeated basis makes a world of difference. Ask them about these risky behaviors because you'll be able to stratify who are the ones that are going to run into problems down the road. And now with all this meaningful use stuff, you may be able to, you know, slip in um, some meaningful collection of things like heights, weights, BMIs, and stuff like that. And so with that, uh, thank you for your attention.